Right, we'll continue with the multi-messenger astronomy. So with Stephen Smart. So Stephen completed his PhD at Queen's University in Belfast and worked at the ING telescopes on La Palma and the Canary Islands. He then held an STSC fellowship in Cambridge and went back to Queen's University of Belfast as a lecturer in 2004. He was the director of the Astrophysics Research Centre from 2011 to 2017. Stephen works on massive stars, supernova, and wide, wide field sky surveys, particularly the time, date, time domain aspect of wide, wide field telescope surveys and finding transient objects. Stephen. So, should I use the microphone? Can you hear me up the? Can you hear me easily at the back? No. Quite happy to yes. use it. You can hear me okay. Good. Most of the students are at the front, and all the uh, staff are at the back. That's great. <laughs> that's, a difference. that's a big difference. All right. So, um, this is the last. The last. This is the. Uh, these are the last two talks of the. Uh, uh, of the of the meeting. Uh, thanks to Neil for a uh, fantastic introduction to. Uh, uh, short GRBs and, and killing over. So I'm going to go over some of the basics for uh, searching for electromagnetic counterparts with a focus um, on optical searches from the ground um, uh, that, that complement on our similar to the near and wide field near infrared searches that uh, that Neil talked about uh, because we have the, 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 the technology to do it and, and to go very wide and, and relatively deep at the minute. Um, and so Please do ask me questions. I know you, um, some of you did during, during Neil's talk. I'm going to ask you a lot of questions as well, just to keep you awake. So here's the first one. Um, and the, the, the reason for this will become clear. So do you know which country has had the world's largest telescope for the longest period in history? No staff allowed to answer. <laughs> just you. What's that? Ireland. Ireland, why is that? Because I'm... <laughs> <laughs> That's not a bad guess. And the answer actually is Ireland. Uh, so Ireland had the largest telescope in the world for 72 years, from 1845 until 1917. 1917 was when the 2.5 meter at California, the Hale telescope was built, and that was what Hubble used to, uh, to measure stars in, in nearby galaxies and infer the Hubble constant. But Ireland, for 72 years, it was the world leader in observational astronomy. This telescope, the Leviathan of Parsons Town, it was called, was built by Lord Ross. You can go and see it. It's been reconstructed in the middle of Ireland, the country awfully in Burr. Big castle here, Burr Castle. Uh, so you can see that's a the two photo, recent photographs of, of the of the castle and, and, and a sketch of the uh, of the telescope as it was two meter telescope a two meter telescope he had it for seventy two years in his back garden so what did he do with it Hubble came along and scooped him inside a few years of course so what did he do with it for seven what what did that actually produce and the answer is this so <laughs> this is the drawing. Uh, that, that were one of the famous drawings that he brought to the Royal Society. So up until that time, Messier had found these fuzzy objects in the sky. Um, and they turned out, of course, to be globular clusters and galaxies. But at the time, they were basically fuzzy objects that were not stars and not planets. But no one's had, this was the first time. This telescope produced the structure of spiral galaxies. Uh, there were no, the key thing here is that this is a drawing. I think the reason that is not better known, that telescope is not better known, is so there's an image from Hubble. I mean, that's a pretty good drawing. So that's the recent Hubble image of, of M51. Um, so he was the first to show that these galaxies did have spir had this spiral structure and weren't just faint fuzzy blobs, and, the, and that the spiral galaxies were different to globular clusters, and their structure were different. But the, probably the reason that this was not, is not as well known is that the light detecting technology had not advanced beyond pen and paper and pencil. Right? So here's a, here is a photograph. So photograph that people could take photos. His wife was a photographer. Um, but they hadn't developed actually being able to take a photograph through the telescope, actually attaching the, de the light detecting technology to the uh, light collecting area of the telescope. So they were reduced to, he was reduced to drawing pictures, impressive though they were, and he impressed everyone in the Royal Society, of course, and discovered that spiral galaxies exist. They didn't quite get link up the photography, and that's what Hubble did. He took photographic plates, measured the uh, brightness of Cepheids, and then measured the Hubble constant, of course. So, light detecting technology is the key thing that drives most a lot of observational astronomy, and having detectors, sensitive detectors, and big sensitive detectors is really what drives a lot of uh, 
uh, discovery in observational astronomy and this uh, follow-up of gravitational waves is, is no different. So that's the, that's the context. Okay, so you've seen, um, you've seen these, I guess, during the, these uh, two weeks. Uh, four secure detections of binary black hole mergers uh, over the last two years. Interesting things that might pop out here. Um, so, well, I'll ask you, what are the interesting um, as, whoops, aspects of these uh, parameters in the context of us trying to find electromagnetic counterparts like uh, Neil thought about, right? These are black hole mergers, of course, not the neutron star, neutron star black hole mergers, but of these parameters here, which are the ones that immediately you would think would we need to start thinking about uh, if we're searching for electromagnetic counterparts? Right, so uh, Correct, so those are the sky maps, yes. Very important. What about the other things here? Maybe the, the, any of these um, uh, parameters that are, that are shown here? Redshift. Redshift or distance is the key thing. Yeah. Anything else? Exactly. So those are really the two things. It's sky localization and the distance of these things. So you can see that the, the distance is here uh, for the binary black hole mergers, redshift 0.2, corresponding to about a gigaparsec or so, uh, which is quite far for, um, for, this, for, the, the, for the counterparts that, that Neil talked about. So I'll come back to, the, uh, to that. So the two, as you said, the two key things, sky localization regions here, we're, our, we're up at the of order 200 to 2,000 square degrees. Um, and that's the the, the, the localization within which we have to try and pin down the, uh, the counterparts. So why do we want to do it? So Neil touched on, on, on much, the, much of this and covered a, a quite a bit of it in detail. Um, if we can find the electromagnetic counterparts, great opportunities for high energy physics, studying the compact, complex, um, uh, compact remnants, the nucleosynthesis of the R process elements that uh, Neil talked about that are either produced in, um, in core collapse, so the R, everything, um, uh, the R process elements that are produced, which are heavier than iron, are either produced in core collapse supernovae. It's got to be somewhere where uh, there's, a, there's a large flux of neutrons, either in supernovae or in uh, neutron star mergers. Um, looking at the velocity of the graviton versus the speed of light, because if, you, if there's any difference there the co of the distances these are at, if there's any difference between them, uh, we, we wouldn't see it. If we see an electromagnetic counterpart, we immediately know the, um, that the, the, the graviton travels at the speed of light. Um, there is work on these, using them to be, if we can find enough of them, they may be standard uh, sirens, a bit like standard candles, we may be able to use them to probe uh, cosmology. And of course, just the genuine excitement of actually seeing the source that produced the gravitational wave localizing its host galaxy. Um, so there's huge interest around the world in trying to find these, uh, these counterparts. Um, so as Neil said, what we, what we might expect to see what sources might we expect to be able to detect in the, in the electromagnetic regime? Uh, black hole, black hole mergers uh, may not produce anything, um, although I'll come back to that. Uh, obviously it's neutron star mergers and black hole neutron star mergers that, that uh, are predicted now to be strong emitters of electromagnetic radiation and there's detailed predictions that Neil showed that I'll, uh, I'll come back to on the, uh, on the flux that we might expect to see. The short GRBs are the working Neutron star mergers are the working model for short GRBs. As Neil showed, the gamma rays are likely beam, so we are unlikely <coughs> to get a short GRB. Um, we are unlikely to get a trigger in, in, uh, in gamma rays because of the beamy effect for, um, for a gravitational wave source. We might get it, but it's unlikely. Particularly if the beaming angles are of order 10 degrees or so. But the not only, uh, so uh, Neil focused on the, the idea of these kilonova and infrared uh, bright transients, but there's a range of electromagnetic um, transients that are predicted for, um, for these neutron star mergers. So this is quite a, there's quite a lot of information in this diagram. This is a nice review by Fernandez and, and Metzger about um, electromagnetic counterparts from, um, uh, from neutron star and uh, black hole mergers. So this just shows you that the, oops, so up here um, is, so this is schematic of the event. So if we have a neutron star, neutron star black hole merger, um, it may produce a massive neutron star. That massive neutron star might have a strong magnetic field and that's something we call a, a, a magnetar. It might produce a, a, a black hole with a, a relativistic uh, jet um, that may produce the R process elements. 
So up here, this schematically shows what we might expect to see, the gravitational wave uh, here. Um, we may expect to see a short PRB, but probably not because of the beaming. We might expect to see the X-ray emission, uh, extended X-ray emission, um, and as Neil showed, that may not be beam, so, uh, so that's definitely worth uh, uh, following up for all, for all events. And then from the, from the UV through to the radio, there are predictions that, um, that either neutron star mergers or neutron star black holes may give signals both in the, in the near infrared, as, as Neil talked about, but also potentially in the UV and in, in the blue and in the radio. Uh, maybe the radio may take sort of month or, months or years to come out as the, as the shock wave hits the, um, uh, the interstellar medium or dense parts of the interstellar medium. Um, it's possible, and there are quantitative predictions that are, that are in this paper um, and, and, and reviewed in this paper, and then the, the individual papers are, are, are referenced here. Um, so there may be a source of free neutrons, and free neutrons will decay. And Brian Metzger has predicted there might be a, a UV pulse coming from these, uh, this streaming of free neutrons. Uh, it may be that some nickel-56 is produced, and I'll, I'll show you why that's, that's important. It's what drives uh, makes type 1a supernova super bright, and if there is any, if there is any nickel-56 produced, that, will, um, that may drive a, a blue com an early blue component in the, um, in the light curve. Uh, and then Neil talked about the, uh, the R process elements, which, drive the, which may drive this near, the near-infrared uh, flux here. So there are quantitative predictions that are, many of them, quite plausible. Um, that may produce um, uh, an electromagnetic signal right from the gamma rays right through the, to the radio. So that's why there's, there, is, there is still, although this is a, it's a tough project because of that, those sky localiza localization areas up to 2,000 square degrees, uh, because of all of these quite plausible uh, predictions based on uh, radiative transfer and uh, uh, radi a decay of neutrons, nickel-56, the R process elements, there's potential for discovering uh, um, the counterparts at many wavelengths. So that's what's driving a lot of the excitement. The theorists are driving quite a lot of the excitement in, uh, for the observers to, uh, to follow these up, even though it is, um, it's currently still uh, a very difficult project. So Niels showed some versions of these light curves. So this is, uh, the, these light curves are days versus either energy uh, or absolute magnitude, I'll show. And I'll give you some rules of thumb to try and uh, flick between these to try and give you uh, uh, ways to put that, you know, to get ballpark figures and try and put this in your, be able to calculate this in, in, your, in your head to look at what's, um, at what's possible. Um, so everyone familiar with uh, magnitudes? Yeah. Uh, I'll come back to this. I'm going to get you to do a task, so I'll come back to this. Um, and this will be, so this will be important. So, so a magnitude is just uh, the, the logarithm of the flux estimated uh, on the log scale of 10 with this scale of 2.5. So uh, and plus some constant to put it on a scale. Okay. Can you read that? Looks a bit like. No. No. Okay. I get a better pen. Oh my <laughs> oh, am I the first to use the whiteboard? That's <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 so, that looks terrible. All right, that's better. So for every, when you see these uh, plots in magnitude, for every magnitude, it's a factor of 2.5. Okay, so, uh, oops. Um, so a magnitude is just the flux. If the flux is in physical units, for example, here, ergs per second, where erg, of course, is the CTS unit of energy. And um, so a magnitude is defined by this. Um, and as I say, it rarely exists. So every, every, uh, my, every uh, a, a, a magnitude is a factor of 2.5. And the C just it determined, uh, it determined by the by your magnitude system. Um, so you can see, so these go from 10 to the 42, uh, peak to, potentially peak at 10 to the 42. So these are just some examples of uh, potential signatures. And Neil touched on the, uh, or gave some uh, quite a lot of detail on the uh, kilonova type models, which are produced by the R process elements. Um, some of these, so I'll come back to the, um, uh, the ones on the left of uh, various um, or various models of uh, these kilonova 56 disc that then produces iron, and so you can see that peaks quite early. So uh, at, at the, on the on the right hand side, this is this, this is, these are the um, these radiative transfer uh, calculations. There's several groups that have done these, and they they off they come up with very similar uh, results. 
So both the Don Kaysen's model, uh, models in Berkeley and the Tanaka models in, uh, from Japan, uh, they estimate uh, these absolute magnitudes of around minus 15 to minus 16, or minus 14 to minus 16, depending on the, uh, on the wave band. To put that in context, text, the, the supernova we typically find at cosmological distances, 100 to gigaparsecs with moderate size facilities, are of order minus 15 to minus 19. So they certainly are in the early, in the early phases, they're in the ballpark of, um, of supernova uh, luminosities, and we find those easily, and I'll show you many examples of, of, of how we do that. So these are all um, of, the, of the time scale. You have to react, it's of the order of a few days, up to 10 days, perhaps up to a couple of weeks. Um, and their luminosity is similar to the supernova we typically find in, uh, in our survey. So quite plausible we might, that we might find them from the ground. So those are for, of course, neutron star, neutron star mergers or neutron star black hole mergers where you've got some mass, you have some baryons and they may produce um, uh, these, uh, these signals. Uh, there are a small number of predictions for, because we've got these four signals, which are all black hole binary systems, so it is, is it even worth attempting to go and look for these? Um, well, there are a few papers, theoretical papers, so what are the observers, of course, driven by the interest from uh, the predictions by the, by the modelers? Uh, for neutrons, for systems involving neutron stars. There are a small number of papers that predict potential uh, electromagnetic signatures from uh, binary black hole mergers. Not all of them have been well received uh, as, uh, as, as, as likely to, to, um, to occur. This is one uh, recently. Um, if there are binary black hole mergers, ba the basis of it is with binary black holes in a vacuum, you're unlikely to see anything. Um, if there's any mass at all around that system, as Neil showed, accretion onto a, a central uh, massive remnant is an extremely efficient process. So if there's any mass at all around these uh, uh, binary black hole systems that has the potential to produce uh, a signature with the accretion of that mass onto the, onto the black holes. So of course that mass has to be close to the, uh, to the system. These black holes presumably came from, almost certainly came from massive stars. Massive stars produce winds, massive stars lose mass. Um, they may well still have what have been called fossil disks sitting around the, uh, the binary black hole system. There's another paper, this is a paper by Selma de Mink and Andrew King, that suggests that if there is a, a remnant disk or a fossil disk around, the, around the, uh, the binary black hole system, that the release of, um, of energy from the, from the merger may perturb the disk, and if any of that material starts to fall on the central remnant, that's a very efficient pr uh, a process of producing energy. There's another paper by uh, Perna and collaborators, which, is a, which is a, a predicts a, a similar sort of thing. So they suggest you might have the two things you want to know is how fast, if this occurs, so this paper doesn't do detailed radiative transfer calculations like we've seen for the neutron star uh, 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 models, uh, but it just gives ballpark estimates of, of what energy might be produced. Uh, the two things you want to know, of course, is how fast, the time scale in which the energy might come out uh, and how much of it there, there may be. So here's the two basic equations that they came up with. If this is plausible, and it's certainly not implausible, there may be some material sitting around the black holes. It'd be such an exciting discovery that I think we should look. Um, so here's a, the time scale might be of a few hours, uh, scaled by M60 is the mass, total mass of the system, scaled to 60 solar masses, um, uh, divided by uh, uh, V, which is the, um, the greater of the Keplerian uh, velocity. Um, in the inner orbit and the recoil velocity. So of order, the, you know, the, 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 the characteristic velocity of, of the system. So if that's a thousand kilometers per second, then it's, it's an order of a few hours. And the total luminosity here uh, that they predict with these scaling factors, which are all very uncertain. So we, many of the, these, could, these could vary. If this happens, if this actually does happen in nature, then many of these could plausibly vary by a, a factors of several. But of order 10 to the 50, 42. 10 to the 42, remember, here is of order, uh, and I'll show you it's an absolute magnitude, roughly an absolute magnitude of minus 16 if it came out in, in the optical. And that's about supernova magnitude. So something which has got a, a few hours time scale, which is supernova luminosity, that's plausible to, to detect, even at these cosmological distances of the, of the binary black hole mergers. So while this is very speculative, a little bit uncertain, um, uh, it, it's... it's, it's uh, motivated us to, uh, to continue to look even for the binary black hole systems. Sorry. Let me just give you the, uh, the other reference here is Perna Lazar in Giacomazzo uh, who suggested a, a similar sort of, uh, 
similar sort of idea. Okay, so of order 10 to the 42 um, on a time scale of urge per second on a time scale of a, of a few hours. Uh, that's, the, that's the prediction here. Now, of course, those two things, the luminosity, the time scale in which they might come out, combined with the, um, the sky areas that we've seen, and you've, you've seen this maps and Neil showed these earlier, uh, makes this a difficult uh, problem so the, to, uh, to tackle. Um, these are the four uh, sky maps. Um, the first three uh, were published together, and then, of course, the, uh, the, the one in uh, January this year. So you can see the sky maps are 1,600 square degrees, 1,000 square degrees, 200 square degrees in the best case, the highest signal to noise event. Of course, this is just with LIGO. Uh, the two LIGO uh, detectors, Virgo, will, will help this significantly um, with, for the higher signal to noise events. But we're looking at 200 to 2,000 square degrees uh, to cover to try and locate any electromagnetic counterpart. Um, so the reason, and, and, and Neil showed this as well, the reason why we want to do this, particularly in the optical or near infrared, we would like to do it, of course, with any, any information across the whole wave band uh, from, from gamma rays right through to radio would be, would be extremely interesting. Uh, but what drives us to do it in the optical and the near infrared is getting the distance, getting the redshift. Um, uh, this is the first, uh, this is the um, error box for the first optical counterpart for gamma ray bursts, and Neil gave the history of, uh, of GRBs. So for, GR, for uh, GRBs, where the, um, the GRB was located to of order arc minutes, if you look at that region of sky in the optical, there's lots of things there. Uh, the key thing in, in, doing, in, in finding uh, the distance to the source, and therefore its luminosity, uh, and deriving the, the, the physical nature is the identification in the optical and then a spectrum. So that's really what's driving the, us to do this alone. We may well find them in the, uh, at high energy. We may well find them in the, in, in the, in the radio. Actually get in, getting it in the optical is the fundamental thing uh, to try and get to get a redshift. Uh, so Neil showed this, first optical counterpart to a GRB. Uh, that's the zoom in of that, uh, of that box there. Uh, of course, there's still lots of sources there, so it's not just um, it's not just one image you take, you've got to take several and then you look for the thing that's fading rapidly or changing significantly and that gives you a clue what it, what it might be even with these, even with error boxes of these are, this is a few arc minutes, not 2,000 square degrees. Um, and that's the host galaxy of that. So the key thing is identify them in the optical or near infrared to arc second precision because that's the only way you can get a, uh, a spectrum of the, of the source with a large telescope. And uh, we think these are probably not going to be that bright because we haven't really seen anything, which is potentially a kilonova signature within 100 megaparsecs or so. So they're, um, uh, they're, they're, likely not, they're likely not to be staring at us in the, in the face. Um, so the optical or a near-infrared identification is absolutely critical to get the, uh, to get the redshift. First redshift for our uh, GRB. Uh, that's the spectrum of, of a first redshift. So it's, uh, as Neil said, there's a lot of parallels between uh, the, the, the history of GRBs identifying these sources at high energy, very large error boxes, and then focusing down uh, to optical, which gives up with down at the arc second resolution so we can get large telescopes on the uh, optical uh, component. And in the optical, there's lots of atomic transition lines, and that's where we derive the, the redshifts. So either, um, absorption lines from the transient itself or emission lines from the host galaxy. So these are two examples of the first GRB with the op optical counterpart found. That was, this is a spectrum of the host and those two lines, uh, those several lines are due to emission lines from the host galaxy. Uh, this one, different technique. You take a spectrum of the, of the GRB when it's bright. You see absorption lines. You've got to do that when it's bright. So you don't see these absorption lines, of course, in the low signal to noise spectrum of the host galaxy, but you do see it in the, do see these quite often. These are interstellar medium uh, lines in the host galaxy itself, uh, but the continuum comes from the GRB or the afterglow. Uh, so the point is, it is trying to, is the identification in the optical is, is uh, or near infrared is absolutely critical to, to, getting, a, to getting a redshift, and that's why, uh, that's why we're motivated to do this. And of course, we've got to do it over these very large sky areas. All right, so how, how are we going to do it? So we, here we have 200 to 2,000 square degrees, typically. So this might come down. Maybe we get a good one at 100 square, uh, 100 square degrees with high signal to noise event with Virgo in the next few years. 
Um, uh, but still, it's pretty challenging to go to this, uh, to this size. With GRBs, we were down at the several arc minutes, uh, well below a square degree. Uh, they identify the, uh, the optical components. So there's many people just writing this off saying, oh, we, you know, we're not going to, this is pretty much impossible until LIGO India comes along and we're down to the few tens of, of square degrees. But given the excitement of doing it, there's, there are plenty of us who are going to uh, prepare certainly to take the risk uh, to do this, like Neil's project. So our most sensitive telescopes, so we're not going to do this with, uh, with Hubble. So here's one square degree. Remember, we might have to search 200 to 2,000 square degrees. This is one square degree. Uh, oh my goodness, you can't even see the, the square of the uh, XDF here, so let me trace it out. If I can, it's about this size. Okay, so that's the field of view that Hubble sees. That's one square degree. Uh, this is the field of view that the, the, the largest instrument on the VLT sees. 0 0.07 square degree. So these most sensitive telescopes we have are absolutely no use to do the survey of 200 to 2,000 square degrees. We've got to think of another way. They are extremely useful if we do identify something within those, and they are critical to following up and finding out what the sources are within those. But to, first of all, we've got to scan these areas with some other technique before we apply the largest and most sensitive facilities we have to, uh, to study the objects in detail. Okay, so let me give you the basics here um, of what of uh, of why the reason why we can't we can't uh, use these uh, these large facilities, right? So the basics here of uh, of, of uh, telescopes op optics is that the plate scale is two oh six over f, and that's in units of, and this will become clear why sec per millimeter. Okay, so if you have, um, so if we have a, um, this is just set by telescope geometry and optics. So for a telescope with a, uh, a focal length of f, the plate scale, so this is the, um, the effective resolution at the uh, at the focal plane and then the camera that you use in the telescope is totally determined by the focal length. The, 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 the D doesn't come into the equation. You're right. So that's arc second per minute. So that's going to define the size of a focal plane that you need to cover a certain sky area. Um, now, we often use the, um, the F ratio of the telescope uh, to define it. So you can see it's F over D. So of course, there's going to be a limit on F. So the, the, the larger you make your telescope, if you keep the focal length the same, what do you think is going to happen to the beam? So the larger you make this, this angle becomes bigger. Right? So think of all the, the light rays that are hitting that from the, from the, tel from the telescope. So effectively, what's, uh, what, what do you think is happening here in terms of light rays, which, which are no close to normal to the, to the telescope mirror compared to the ones that are caught on the edge? So you've got to, you want to use all of the aperture, of course. Just think of these two angles. And then one which is close. Think of that angle and that angle. Observing more of the sky. Sorry? You're observing more of the sky with one image. You certainly do, but the, the fact that we've got two, we've got our, our optical system has to cope with two, uh, with, has to cope with uh, light beams coming in at very different angles, which means you've got to put in an optical corrector here to correct the whole field across this very wide, uh, very wide field that we're, we're now seeing because, this, uh, because we're keeping the, uh, the focal length short. And so the optical distortions are extremely hard to remove. So the bigger you make your telescope, the, you're usually forced to make the focal length much bigger to be able to get a good, good optical imaging across the, across the field. There's a limit to what you can, to what you can do here. So, 
how would you, with here, what we'll consider is currently, so currently the largest uh, detectors we have, uh, the currently the largest single detector we have is a, a, a detector which is 10,000 10, by 10,000 pixels. Now, of course, you can, you can put these together and mosaic them and put lots of them, but let's assume we've got one detector, uh, and our detector has, uh, in this case, we've got a detector which is 10,000 by 10,000 pixels. And that's an image of the, of the largest single detector. So you can mosaic them and you can have larger, larger ones, but this is a, an example of a single uh, 10K by 10K detector. Um, if we want to maximize the, um, if you want to maximize the, uh, the field of view, um, how do we, how would we, we effectively got to increase the plate scale? So what would we have to do to F? F, you got to maximize the plate scale, All right? So let's say for a fixed for a fixed detector, which is ten thousand by ten thousand pixels, and each of those is uh, ten micron. They're typically ten micron pixels or so. So let's say you have a fixed. You can make your camera bigger, of course, but let's say for a fixed for a fixed size of camera, you want to make the go for a wider field. You got to make the plate scale bigger. So for F, you got to make it smaller. You got to make it smaller. So you have a big telescope, you've got, to, you've got to reduce the F ratio, but you run into this problem, of course, is that if you have a, a very big mirror and you're trying to compress it, you just run into the problem of correcting the optics over the whole field. So if you're, let me give you, a, let me give you an example here. So let's say we have, um, we want a one degree field of view, right? Okay. So let's say we want one degree field of view. So we want this to be one degree. Because we're looking at 200 degrees, 2,000 square degrees, so any smaller than a, than a degree in here, we're, we're difficult to okay. And we're going to have a, a CCD, which is this size. Okay, so let me give you a few minutes to see if you can work out um, what the uh, F ratio of a large telescope, or what the focal length of a, uh, a large telescope would be to give us uh, a one degree field of view with this detector. Okay, so let me give you five minutes to do that. So I would suggest if you could, if you could just do it together in the little groups that where you're sitting, right? So let's see if you can work this out. So you know what I'm asking. So I want to see the uh, the focal length of a of a telescope, uh, which is going to give us a one degree field of view with this detector, which is that size, just with this. Okay, let me give you a couple of minutes to do that. What time? Are, what time are you to finish? Quarter twelve forty-five. Thank you. 
Remember, D doesn't come into it for now. We'll come back to the telescope diameter. All you want to work out is the focal length required for this detector, which is one degree. So, you need to work out, the, so uh, we want to know f in this equation, so you need to work out the plate scale. So the plate scale here, I want to have one degree, I want this detector to give me a one degree field of view. So you work out, there's 10,000 pixels and there are 10 microns, um, I want to see a one degree, I, we want a one degree field. So you need to work out the, the plate scale that produces one degree with that detector. Uh, okay, so so the total we want the, the plate scale is the um, is the scale on the detector, and we want a total field of view of one degree. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, Okay, so we've got so we want the detector to cover 300 or 3,600 arc seconds. Okay, um, and we've got 10,000 pixels times 10 microns. So you, you can work out the size of the detector. So, so you can work out um, the arc seconds per millimeter of the that the, that the detector needs to cover, right? And then you plug it into that. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a term. It's a, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah.
So anybody got an answer for F? Yep. Oh, Neil has? Okay. <laughs> Hope I'm right. Hope it matches Neil's. <laughs> Seven what? 72 meters? 72 meters? No, factor 10 out. Yeah, good, you're right, you're all right. I got six, but that's all right. Very good, very good. <laughs> all right, so. All right, so let me show you. Let me show you. So one degree is, uh, is 10,000 uh, pixels. So each pixel has to be so pixel size, uh, let me not use PS, let me use the size of the pixels is 0.36 arc seconds, right? So to get to get one degree, for this detector to be one degree, the pixels have to be 0.36 arc seconds. Uh, okay. Um, and so we have the plate scale is uh, 206 over F. So we want to work this out. We want to work out the plate scale and um, arc seconds per millimeter. So this will imply that we've got uh, 0.3 arc seconds per pixel or 0.36 arc seconds per 10 microns. And that means that's 36 arc seconds per millimeter. Okay, so that's the plate scale we have here. So 36, it's just 206 over F. So F is about six meters. Okay, so you got a focal, a focal length of six, of six meters. Now I think we want um, our largest telescopes, we want to be the most sensitive, we want to be sensitive. These are pretty faint things. Um, if you think our focal length has to be six meters, and we want to use, say, a 10 meter telescope, the biggest telescope on Earth, think of the geometry of that. Six meters for the focal length. A mirror size of 10 meters, that's an extremely compact telescope. It would have an F ratio, our F ratio is defined as uh, six over 10, that's an F ratio of 0.6. Realistic optical systems have F ratios of, of around two, where you can actually where you can correct, actually correct the optics and correct all of the light beams coming in to give you a good focus on the focal plane. This is just this is an impossible um, uh, system to 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 engineer, right? So for a large telescope, the only option of actually getting good fo good quality is to increase the focal length. And if you increase the focal length, what do you do with the field of view? It, it, it becomes much smaller. So this is the difficulty in building very big wide field telescopes. The geometry is just is, is difficult. And this, is the, the, this is the challenge of the whole uh, of this field where we're looking at um, trying to cover hundreds of square degrees, but we want the sensitivity. It becomes, it becomes difficult. Um, okay, so um, the other option is when you're designing teles uh, telescopes is to get good image quality, um, so the one on the left is is, off, is called a um, prime focus configuration, where where the where the beams are um, the light beams are brought to focus at uh, prime focus without any other reflections. Most large telescopes are, are do not have prime focus cameras, but they have cameras which are at uh, um, and instruments which are at another focus where you insert more optics. So, for example, on the on the right, you've got a secondary mirror here. Uh, that increases the focal length, which increases the um, decreases the plate scale. Uh, you can still do the same thing here. So this one is much easier because look at the look at the speed of that of that beam, the angle of that beam coming in. It's much easier to get that focus. It's not you don't have this very wide opening angle uh, for the light beams coming in. This is easier to to engineer, but the focal length goes up. The plate scale is half. And therefore, to cover the same amount of sky area, you need four times the number of pixels. So you need four times your detectors, so the cost goes up again. So you can um, go to longer focal lengths for wide field systems, but then the cost of the of the imaging cameras goes up by a factor of four. Okay, so 
there are different ways of getting around this. So one obvious way of doing it is to um, reduce D. Okay. So you can, at six meters, if we made a little tiny telescope here with one meter uh, aperture mirror, then it would be a much, um, a much more tractable uh, problem. And easy, the telescope's easy to build, but you don't get the aperture. So the, like, let me give you the extremes of the, uh, of the techniques that are being used currently for wide field systems uh, to map out large areas of sky. Uh, here's the extreme end. Uh, on the, which goes for the widest field possible. Uh, little, ca little ca cameras, not even full telescopes, little lenses, 14 centimeters, or 10 meter mirrors on the, on the VLT. Four, um, 14 centimeter lenses, their F ratio is 2.8. Uh, the cameras are 2K by 2K uh, detectors, pretty cheap. 10 micron pixels, similar to these large ones. Um, and this one is called is run by Assassin, which is called the All All Academy. Sorry, that should be All Sky <laughs> Automated Survey for uh, uh, for Supernova. Um, they developed this over the last few years. It's mostly for Supernova. I think they are they do want to do uh, gravitational wave stuff, but um, they're really focused right at the bright end. Seventeenth magnitude is the uh, is is their is their sens sensitivity limit. I'll come on to comparing the uh, uh, the magnitudes here. But the interesting thing here for uh, uh, for Assassin is that it's got an extremely wide field of view, so then mapping out 100 square degrees, 200 square degrees, 2,000 square degrees is quite, uh, is quite plausible. So for this one, for example, so let's look at this. So this has got, um, so where are we? We have got uh, F is 2.8, okay. uh, uh, D, the diameter of the telescope, is 0.14, so the 14 centimeter uh, lenses. So we've got the F ratio is F over D, okay, which means F is uh, 0.29 meters, okay, which you can see there, 14 centimeters, you can see the geometry. So they're little things, 14 centimeters by that size. Those are, those are, the, those are the lenses. And then there's just a, a, an electronic detector, four electronic detectors is bolted on the back of those of those lenses. It's actually quite an efficient system. So that gives us, so, um, so the plate scale here is then our equation. So remember this is uh, 206 divided by the focal length, which is 206 divided by 0.39, and that gives us 528 arc seconds millimeter um, and these are 15 micron pixels and that corresponds to 7.9 arc seconds so uh, they're big chunky pixels so remember the resolution of uh, our typical sky resolution that we'd see the atmosphere would give you stars which are about an arc second so these are you know, big pixels of, of 8 arc seconds and an individual point source is contained completely within, a, effectively completely within a pixel. Um, so you've got lots of sky background within, within your pixel, uh, which reduces the sensitivity of the instrument. But the fact that they're seven point, they're, uh, the focal length is so short, 7.9 arc seconds, that gives us, if you work it out for a 2K, a 2K by 2K detector, that implies you've got a, a field of view of four point, roughly 4.4, or 19 square degrees. And then you've got four of those, so 76 square degrees. So that's, that's now becomes interesting, 76 square degrees. We're looking at a few hundred uh, square degrees, a few thousand square degrees to cover. That becomes, a, that becomes a, a, a system that could map these out. Of course, what's the difficult, what's, what's the problem with that? That? Can't very well. Exactly, that's one problem, yes. And of course, just this tiny, this tiny aperture, 14 centimeters. We've got the resolution problem. Resolution problem can be overcome, uh, surprisingly, with this, um, uh, with this system. So they've got a reference image of the sky, 
And for every image, every image they take, they subtract them, they match them up and subtract them. That works even with, even with eight arc second pixels. And the intrinsic resolution of the optical system might be a factor, it might be one arc second or so. The image subtraction worked quite well for this system. They find things on, right on top of galaxy cores. They find lots of uh, transients which are associated with the cores of galaxies which are unresolved. So this, this technique actually works quite well. Um, and so the limiting factor, while resolution is a limiting factor, it works pretty well to pick things up, to pick things up and then you go with a bigger telescope to, uh, to look at them in more detail. The, 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 the problem is just it's 14 centimeters, so the sensitivity is limit, limited. So that's, one, that's the extreme end, the sort of small lens system which gives you, which you can cover basically with, the, with one of these, 76 square degrees, you can cover more or less the, the entire visible sky per night. Right, so the, the, then the, uh, the error boxes of, of the LIGO error, error localization region, regions are trivial. Uh, so these are systems which can get around the whole sky per night, but they're limited in sensitivity. Uh, let me just go to the, uh, the, the other extreme before I come back to the, and then this will show you the other extreme, and then what people are doing is working between the two extremes, and people have different strategies. And he was working in the near infrared with a wide field telescope. Some people are using assassin type things. Others are looking at, here is Subaru, currently the best large wide field telescope in the world. So if, you're thinking, if we're thinking of the largest telescopes on the ground, eight meter telescope is the Subaru telescope. It's the only one which does have a prime focus camera. So most of the other really large telescopes, sorry, uh, have this system, either Cassegrain or inserting a third mirror and shooting it off to the Nazmuth uh, focus. So most large telescopes are like the one on the right. Subaru has been designed where it, it does have a prime focus camera and so it can take advantage of a relatively fast, uh, uh, relatively fast beam and therefore um, produce a, a large field of view for an 8 meter telescope. It is the, it is the widest field 8 meter telescope we have. Um, I will, so what I'll do is I, you can answer these questions here. You can work through this again in the same way as for Sasset. Let me just give you the answers here to this one to show you the, the other extreme of, the, uh, uh, of this. Mm -hmm. So if you work it out for Hyper Supreme Cam, which is the large, uh, the large camera that they have now. So they've got one at prime focus. So you can see F1, when we work this out here, uh, this f 1.9 is the is, is the f what we call the fat when we sit when we turn uh, a, a fast beam it means that number is small so that's the currently physically the the fastest beam on a large telescope we have that 0.16 is just not it's just not doable but 1.9 is uh, a prime focus with a with a specialized corrector lens uh, so the field of view for um, for hyper supreme Cam, which has got a hundred ccds in it so a very expensive camera that ends up with a pixel scale of 0.17 arc seconds. Compare that to 8 arc seconds for the little assassin. Um, and the field of view, when you work it out for all of their detectors, it's actually 1.5 degrees or 1.8 square degrees in total. Okay. 1.8 square degrees compared to 76, but extremely sensitive. So both these systems are useful in their own way. Um, they they're both capable of producing uh, different things, and these are, the, these are the extremes. And so there are also lots of telescopes in between at the one meter, two meter size um, uh, of uh, one meter and two meter size with cameras between sort of 10, 10 square degrees and currently um, up to 40 square degrees. Yes. Do you know how like ELT will compare to this just to give us a... Yeah. Like, because that one is not an all sky, so I guess, but yes. just so you have a feeling. Less than arc, arc minute size at most. Okay. A few arc minutes, right? So again, it's because it's such as, because it's 40 meters, the only option there is to go for a, a relatively slow beam. And so it's, it will not be a survey telescope. So it's, it's, a, it's really, it's, it's a bit, if you think of the Hubble VLT concept where you need survey telescopes and then you go with the, the larger facilities, ELT is of the order of arc minute size uh, field of views. They can't be any, there are no instruments which are any bigger than that. In fact, some of them are done at the arc second level. 
Um, so it, we can't. We can certainly use that to do like JWST and ELT. We can certainly use them to do follow up of sources we may find with these wide field survey telescopes. But they can't do it themselves. Of these, you know, even even if we get down to ten square degrees for LIGO uh, events, it's, it's still way too big. Um, so here is. Um, so this is. Uh, a few square degrees, you know, you might think then doing 100 square degrees is possible, 2,000 square degrees is still, uh, uh, still a bit of a push um, here. Uh, two other, can you think of also, so even if we did have, even if we did use Hyper Supreme Cam, can you think of any other practicalities you would have to think about in doing it? So you want to map out, let's say it is 200 square degrees, you get a really good event, neutron star merger, potentially, 200 square degrees, and you want to use Hyper Supreme Cam, you think of just any practicalities of using that might be an issue. Can you just phone somebody out in the telescope and say, can, can, can you observe us tonight? Can I have the whole night? It's about $40,000 a night to run one of these telescopes. So, is, it, is that a night? That's a, yeah, it's about 40000 a night, isn't it? Not per hour, but 40000 a night to run a telescope. So you can't just phone them up and say, yeah, we got a live over there. Any practicalities of using that? Assassin's cheap, you know, you could build one. You could, one of your university groups, they, Ohio State just, just went, got a small grant, uh, built a very successful uh, survey, finds loads of nearby supernovae. They make them all public, it's very cheap. What about something like Subaru, Hyper Supreme Cam? Because you're going to pay for it, or it's most likely been reserved for something else. Exactly. So, and gravity for what you think is the cat. Yeah. So you can't book the telescope for Yeah. So lots of aspects, all correct. Lots of aspects. One, you've got to get the time. So you have to apply for time and get that allocated. So in Neil's case, he's got lots of time allocated on, uh, on the Vista telescope. You've got to get the time. Uh, secondly, not all, it's not all, the prime focus camera is not always on. They've got lots of instruments. They've got, um, They've got instruments like Cassegrain and the Nasmuth focus here, so that's not they don't always have that camera on. And this is the you know this, this is several tons the actual the actual cameras. You can't just go and take the top end off and put that on. That's a whole day, maybe one or two days work to actually change the to put the camera on. Um, it's a bit it's a multi-user facility as well, Hyper Supreme Cam. Lots of people have time on it. It's doing lots of things. So it's pro it's perhaps the most powerful telescope we have at the minute. Um, but it's not completely dedicated to doing it, uh, to doing these searches, and so um, its impact in this field might be uh, pro will be compromised because they don't have they don't have uh, it doing lots of things and trying to make an impact across all of astronomy, um, whereas some telescopes are just focusing or built to do one particular thing. So getting the time, um, access, or when you need it. Uh, and the third one of actually just getting on the um, the sky localization regions as quickly as possible, um, just a practical thing. Not so much of a problem in Subaru, but it, it does affect everyone else. You say, right tonight, I want to go and observe this. Any reason why you couldn't? What's that? The moon, the moon and the and the sky, moon and clouds. So that's going to affect everyone. Right? But these are the practicalities that you start thinking about. You say, well, tonight I've got to do, go and do it. And it affects all projects. Uh, okay, so let me just summarize uh, where we are. So I'm going to come back to this at, the, uh, uh, at the, uh, the sensitivity of these at the start of the next one. Um, so what we find is that LIGO produces, as you know, these large sky maps. It's really challenging to map these at any, uh, particularly from the ground. We really want to do it from the ground because you've got to get the optical or you're not going to get a redshift, you're not going to get a distance, and then associating them is, is almost impossible. Um, the distance gives the energy emitted, which is absolutely crucial. Um, wide field optical surveys, we've sort of reviewed the challenges and the techniques here. Um, so next I'll have a look at, now we're going to look at the sensitivities and what we might actually be able to detect with systems, either the tiny ones or the big ones or things in between. Okay. Okay, so um, so picking up where we where we left off, we had looked at these two extremes, like the small version of um, uh, sky surveys, which was an uh, uh, example, uh, would be the Assassin project. The other end was the Subaru 
eight meter telescope. We talked about some of the practical issues. So in between, so as, as I say, there's lots of different strategies with telescopes in between those 14 centimeter telescopes and the eight meter telescopes uh, with various groups trying, um, uh, trying to do this and map out the regions. The one I'm working with, uh, and one other, one other practicality, uh, which I'll come to, uh, the, 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 the survey I work with is called the PanStars uh, Telescope, stands for the Panoram Panoramic Survey Telescope and Rapid Response System. Um, it has been, had been doing it before the, uh, uh, the LIGO results <coughs> and detections. It had been surveying the sky for, uh, since around 2008, 2009. So this is in between, so it's a two meter telescope. Uh, it's got a focal length of uh, eight meters, f4.4. Um, the big thing about this is, is that it has the biggest camera that exists uh, at the minute, and this will be surpassed by the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which we uh, which we'll discuss um, in the when we talk about the future. Um, so this has got 60 CCDs, which are 4,800 by 4,800. Um, so it's got an eight by eight array with the corners missing. Um, and so the whole, uh, if you work through our uh, plate scale calculation again and, and uh, match it to the detectors, the field of view is, is about 2.7, 2.8 uh, degrees. Uh, and then that corresponds to total area of 7.7 .7 square degrees. So that's, um, that's getting into the uh, regime where 100 square degrees to 1,000 square degrees is quite plausible. Uh, and we've done, I'll show some examples where we've done some, something like Two to three hundred square degrees in the in the LIGO localization region. So the, the pixels are, um, are are ten microns. So going through the same calculation you get, but you can see it's uh, a competitive. You can see. So there's John Tonry who was the inventor of these. Uh, the CCDs are um, they're they have some issues. They're uh, cosmetically they're 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 not the cleanest uh, detectors that have ever, ever been built. But they were development chips. That's. That's one of the reasons why this was, because it's expensive to build a, a gigapixel camera. And um, so we got all of these CCDs, or the, the project got all of these CCDs relatively cheaply from the development, um, from the developer, uh, because they were, were early stage uh, development chips. You can move the, the charge on the chips in real time. Uh, and, there, and there is potential, we've never fully used it in science mode for surveying, it has been tested, uh, where you can shift the charge um, at the same frequency as, uh, uh, the atmosphere um, perturbs some of the optical distortions that you, that you get in a, in a wide field optical telescope and so there's the potential to increase the image quality. We've never fully used it in, uh, in, this, in this survey science but uh, the chips are very impressive from, uh, from a technological point of view. But you can see the size of the focal plane uh, of, on, the, on the CCDs uh, which, is being, which are being held up there. So currently it is the biggest camera for civilian use or maybe others for military use that we don't know of but uh, it's, this is the biggest camera currently in, in use uh, in civilian use. Uh, so seven, um, seven to eight uh, square degrees. Um, the big advantage that, uh, that, that we have and a couple of other projects have uh, so um, well just before moving on just to show you the size of the optics in this because that's the, those are, that's the size of the, uh, of the detector focal plane. That's the size of the camera shutter with the pineapples, just to put it in, um, in context. Uh, and that's the size of the filter system that we have. In, uh, that we have. So we have a set of uh, uh, five filters, uh, six filters, in fact. And those are, that's, the, uh, that's the filter mechanism there. So you can see the, the optics here are, are huge. Um, and the way this works, because of the, it's still a relatively uh, tough challenge to build a, 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 a telescope, a two meter telescope that, that will deliver a, a three degree field of view. So very difficult to do that at prime focus. Um, so the system here has got the primary mirror would be uh, here. So there's the primary mirror. So the light will come in this end. Uh, so here's the light coming in, reflects up. That's the secondary mirror, M2. Uh, and so that reflects down here. These lines are just ba are baffles so, uh, to reduce scattered light because in a wide field telescope, one of the challenges is you get moon glints um, and so scattered light, even off bright stars and things close to the field of view or which, um, uh, which may, some of the light which, which may come in here, for example, uh, may get reflected onto the CCDs and you get, you get scattered light and glints and things that uh, 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 reduce the image quality uh, and create higher background. So these are baffles just to re just to reduce the scattered light. So as the that's uh, that's the secondary mirror. So light comes in secondary mirror through the baffles, and then there's a system of three lenses: L1, L2, 
shutter mechanism, L3, and those are the lenses that correct the distortion across the whole field uh, to produce relatively um, consistent image quality across that three degree field. That's still quite a, a challenge uh, to, to build those, uh, to build optics that will deliver a, um, a uniform uh, image quality across, across the whole field. Uh, so this has been working for a, uh, for a while now. So the advantage we have um, in this project and a couple of other ones have it is that we've already surveyed the whole of the northern sky down to, down to the declination of minus 30 to the pole. Uh, in, uh, in the, uh, I'll show you some examples of filters, but uh, they, from the filters basically from about 4,000 uh, angstroms up to a micron in a set of five filters. We've got a multicolor image of the sky, which means as soon as we find, as soon as there is a, uh, a trigger of a, a, a localization map, we can immediately go and observe that bit of sky, take our reference image and subtract them and immediately find transients. So if you don't have that reference image, you go and you look at a bit of sky, well then, then the next question is, well, I've got my image, what has changed or what's new in that image? And um, so we do have, a, that, that is a major advantage where we can immediately do it and anything that's, then you can find things on a daytime, daytime scale after the release of the, uh, of the gravitational wave uh, alert. Um, so all of this also is public now. So we've released a full, the full image of the sky is public at the Space Telescope Institute. You can go and look at, if you look up Space Telescope Institute Pan Stars, you'll be able to go to their website. You can download the whole catalog of the sky, every, every galaxy and every star. Uh, brighter than about 23rd magnitude um, is, is publicly available now above minus 40. So the Sloan Digital Sky Survey was the leading uh, survey for imaging. We go a bit deeper. Sloan still has the advantage of lots of spectra. They're, they were an imaging and a spectroscopic uh, um, survey. So we didn't, take, we didn't have a wide field uh, spectroscopic component uh, for this, but um, it's, it's deeper than Sloan. It's significantly deeper in the, in the redder bands because our, our chips are very red sensitive. And, um, we will be releasing a lot. Uh, this is a, a stack. We've got a, about 100 epochs at each of the each image, each point in the sky, and we will be releasing all of those individual 100 epochs in the future. But at the minute, it's just the whole stack, static sky uh, that's available at Space Telescope. Uh, you can download little image stamps, or you can download big part, big bits of the image, uh, and you can download the whole the whole catalog that's available. So that's a big advantage for us. We can immediately in Hawaii once we image part of the gravitational wave localization. We subtract the uh, the reference image from that target image, and uh, anything new then immediately pops up, and then we process the data. Uh, we've also so we go down to minus thirty. We've also done our own. Um, so everything above minus thirty is is public. We've also gone down to minus forty five. So effectively now we've got eighty five percent of the sky covered as a as a as a reference image. Uh, of course, then we are limited by the depth. We can go deeper than this, but we are limited. When we do this difference imaging, we are limited by the depth currently in our, in our static sky. Uh, but this is, this is a very useful resource. So, um, so that's one in the middle. Assassin in one end, Subaru in the other end. These are two examples. There are others, other small, smaller uh, aperture facilities. Um, and um, Pan Stars is in the middle, and there's others in the middle. And uh, uh, Neil's project with Vista sort of is in the middle as well. It's a four meter telescope, um, uh, but they're working in the near infrared and the sky's brighter there. So of, of order, they're sort of similar sense. Pan stars and, and Vista are quite complementary. Uh, so this shows you the magnitude limit, uh, which each of these reach. Assassin does 90 second exposures. Pan stars does, we typically would do, uh, our normal survey strategy would be 30 seconds. I've shown Hyper Supreme Cam here is 30 seconds. There's no real point in going below 30 second exposures because you become dominated by the overheads and actually reading out the telescope and then moving to the next position. So there's no point doing a one second exposure and then having a 20 second overhead, right? It's because you're totally dominated. So about 30 seconds is, the, is, is typically the lowest we would go. Uh, that shows you the magnitude limit. So Assassin, yeah, very good. A, a, a telescope or a facility like Assassin is very good, 80 square degrees, but 17.5, you'll see the limitations of that, uh, of that magnitude limit soon uh, compared to an eight meter telescope where you get into 24.5. Um, and uh, each of these, as I say, a, a magnitude is a factor of 2.5. Uh, five magnitudes is a factor of 100 in flux. So you can see the, uh, the sensitivity difference here. Okay. Um, so what we've gone over in, in, this, in this comparison is really, um, there's a, formally, uh, you'll often see this étendu or survey power is quoted as a, as a figure of merit for survey telescopes. And it's just the area of the, tele, of the, of the primary mirror 
times omega, where omega is the field of view in square degrees, and that's just a measure of um, survey power. So that's giving you the, uh, effectively the energy through the system. You know, A is, the energy through the system is proportional to the, to the area of the primary mirror. That's the number of photons you collect. And it's obviously proportional to the field of view that, uh, that, you, can, uh, that you can observe. So aton do or survey power is effectively the, you know, a measure of the total number of photons through the system. So that's why it's often used for uh, telescopes. So we'll come, um, this is an example of modern telescopes here in a, com a comparison of their aton do in the meter square, degree square. So what I've just shown you, Panstar sits here, currently in black, gray would be its maximum. We're, um, uh, I think in black is a, it's just currently uh, uh, the, what, what, we're, what we're running. Um, others are, not sure why, there's a, there, that is gray. The, the gray here just indicates what, it, it, what its maximum survey power could be, and the black is what it's running at. So the difference is really just how you use it, how much time you dedicate to a survey where we are totally, have been totally dedicated to survey, so I don't know why that's, that's not in black. So this comes from Tony Tyson's review back in 2010. Uh, you'll see that most, a lot of current wide field telescopes that are of order of one to four meter size sit along here, and then there's gonna be a big jump with the large synoptic survey telescope, which we'll come to at the end. Um, another interesting thing here, so, uh, uh, Assassin would sit down here, sort of the small Assassin and other uh, similar facilities uh, that are working would sit down here of order of a few. So although they're very good at, at uh, 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 field of view, their area is not so, uh, obviously pushes them down to low survey power. Um, this is another interesting uh, plot here. So this is a date along here, if you could read it. So that's 1960, that's 2020. Uh, the, the blue line, is the total, if you add up the, um, the area of every telescope in the world, sir? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, why do you, like, I guess you like, make the aperture smaller to get the black regime compared to the gray regime, right? Otherwise, I don't, because the field of view is fixed. Right? <coughs> yes. So why do you make the aperture smaller? What, what does it give you? Uh, so uh, it's back to what we did. So the reason you go for smaller apertures so if you're asking, are you asking why the gray, what's the difference between the gray and the dark yeah, yeah, yeah. here? So this is just how you use that individual telescope. So what they mean here, for example, is um, CFHT is a multi-user telescope. Um, if you dedicate it fully to surveys, that's the maximum you could, it would, it would, it would um, provide, but it's only working about a quarter of the time in full survey mode. They're doing other things, spectroscopic instruments and other things the rest of the time. So it's how you use that facility, nothing to do with how you might change the aperture, just that how you use the facility. Oh, okay, that sounds okay. okay. Um, so the, the, the blue line here is the total area of all telescopic glass in the world. So all facilities above a certain size, the small ones don't really perturb it. So if you add up all of the collecting power of every telescope on Earth, this is how it's, it actually hasn't increased very much since the 1980s. There's a couple of jumps where it goes up. Uh, so this is on a log scale, so obviously it has increased, maybe a factor 10 or so, but uh, if you look at this, other, not as much as CCDs as we'll come to. So um, there's a jump here with 10 meter telescopes. So you can see this is the total glass, cumulative glass area here. And the black, dots are the total number of CCD pixels in use for astronomy. So you can see that they have rocketed up in comparison to the glass area. So that's real, that is one of the things that's really changed survey astronomy is the, uh, the number of CCD pixels that we have staring at the sky. And of course, that number, if that is not tracing our computing power, then we're gonna be in trouble because we won't be able to process the data. But fortunately, that roughly uh, correlates with Moore's law, so the yellow is the number of transistors per CPU, which is basically Moore's law, uh, here going up in yellow, and roughly that our CCD increase uh, is tracking Moore's law, so we're able to keep up with processing. With that uh, increase in pixel density, yes. does that mean you, uh, you reduce the amount of uh, flux you're getting through each individual pixel? So do you have to increase the exposure time to uh, yes, for high so for higher resolution systems where you've got smaller um, for sm if you've got smaller pixels, it actually works to your um, as, as long as you're resolving the PS the, the, the width of the of the PSF, um, 
then uh, you're not you're not getting extra background light into the PSF that you don't otherwise need, right? So yeah, if you're so if you've got big pixels and your star is totally enclosed here, you're getting all of this extra background light into your into your measurement of your object. If you go to if you go then to um, to higher resolution systems where you're actually resolving the thing. And you're resolving your um, resolving the star and spatially sampling the star, probably. Then you can resolve out all of this, and, and you, then you don't include it within your with, within within the the uh, the size of your your point source and point spread function function. So as long as you're sampling it properly, then then um, you reduce the sky the background sky probes. So this is good. We're able able to keep up, and, and uh, within the Pan Star Survey and others, we've. Um, um, uh, just managed to keep ahead of the uh, of the pixel rate with the with the computation rate, um, and that project it 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 bought computers at this at the rate they were increasing. There was no point in buying them all at the start uh, because they probably would have been too slow within a, within a couple of years. So it, it purchased uh, the computing power necessary to process all the pixels on a um, on a on a on a time scale that, that worked. So that's interesting, but we are keeping up with the uh, with the, with the pixel rate. Okay, so um, all right. So now I'm going to move on to uh, some examples of. Um, so this is where we where we left it. Then I'm going to move on to uh, what we might be able to detect uh, and uh, some examples. Um, here's one. Let me give you this example of. Uh, uh, what happened in um, this year? So this is the latest example. I'll give you some of our experience of. Okay, this was a black hole uh, merger, but uh, uh, and at the time, uh, LIGO did release enough information to suggest it was a black hole merger. For the first few, of course, we didn't know at the, at, at the time. LIGO probably knew early on, but didn't want to uh, 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 release all of the information in case they, because uh, it was the first one, which I can fully understand. So at the time, we didn't know whether these were black holes or neutron stars. Uh, like after a few weeks, it became obvious there were black hole mergers. But um, <coughs> I think at that, I think we we will probably still go after the uh, the black hole events just to see if there is anything um, uh, that we can detect. Um, it is uncertain, as a much more uncertain for the black hole mergers. But given that there are a few plausible models, and if there is any mass around the black hole system, accretion is very efficient. Um, we uh, we will likely uh, uh, follow them up. So let me. I'll, I'm going to going to cover um, our experiences of this uh, earlier this year because we did quite a good job on um, on cover, covering the uh, the sky localization region of this one in January on the fourth of January. Uh, so that's the sky localization region. Um, we managed to cover. So this is the uh, gives you roughly ninety percent uh, probability contour here. So you've got a ninety percent likelihood that. The, the source falls within this big ring in the sky because there's only two events and it's basically time. It's the time difference between the, the, uh, the de more or less the time difference between the uh, uh, the detections at, at Hanford and Louisiana. It gives you a big ring on the uh, on the sky, which is slightly broken by various analysis that, that LIGO do. And um, with pan stars, we managed to cover about 43 percent of that. Uh, there's another telescope in Hawaii that I'm involved in, and that's. Intermediate between assassin and pan star, so it's it's a it's a 50 centimeter aperture rather than a 14 centimeter. Uh, so pan star is 1.8 meter. This is this uh, pan uh, this is a half meter telescope, so it covers a wider field than pan stars. It goes out to about 25 square degrees, but at lower sensitivity. And for that, we managed to do 43 percent of the uh, of this. So I mean, what, I think once you're getting up to a few tenths, you know, up to 50 percent of the of the uh, of this, you hope to uh, to cover it. As Neil said, often half of it will be either be in the southern hemisphere and not uh, visible, or behind the sun and, uh, and not visible. So getting to 50% of the total uh, sky localization becomes becomes interesting. Um, and of course, we have this advantage then, where we have the all of the sky available, uh, the reference image of all of the sky available, both for pan stars and atlas, and then we can immediately do the uh, the sky subtraction. Okay, so we do, a, a, although I say well, we can easily do this. It is, a, it turns out just then to be a big computing project. Um, in Hawaii, we have 
eight petabytes of storage, 8,000 cores that, that process the data. So once the hardware works and you, you take the data, it becomes then a, a, a basically a, um, a big computing project. Um, we have a, a database in, in uh, Hawaii with the whole catalog. Um, so we've got to process this data on a daily basis. Uh, what happens is in the in Hawaii, the images come in. The, the reference image is subtracted automatically from the images. Um, catalogs are then made of every source on the image. And then those are shipped to, to Belfast. And we have um, a, a big um, database system in, in Belfast. Uh, we have all local, all of the um, wide field uh, sky catalogs there. So every, all the star catalogs, all the galaxy catalogs and we cross-match the sources with those, and then we pull out things that are not variable stars and not moving objects, um, and maybe associated with galaxies, and then we try and uh, classify those. So it turns out, in, turns out to be a, just a big computing project afterwards. Um, and then we look for things like this that might be, um, that might be uh, detectable. Uh, so of course, PanStars works, and all astronomical telescopes work with filter systems. Okay, so here's an example of a, of a five filter system. That's, U, that's UV, UBVRI, that's the standard Johnson uh, filters. Uh, that's UV light, that's the B band, uh, which is 4,000 angstroms. This is V band, which is 5,000 angstroms. So this plots the transmission of the filters, and that's what they actually look like. So V does look green, R does look red, and V does look blue to your eye. Uh, and the I band, sorry, that's the R, it looks orange. The I band is difficult, you, you get, because it's out here, just at the edge of your vision, if you look through an I band filter, it doesn't look particularly transparent, um, but it transmits, the I band tr transmits 7,000 to 9,000 angstroms a year. So this is the, um, uh, this is the, uh, the filter system. So any, any astronomical object will have a spectrum, of course, and what we see through our filters is, um, is the spectrum multiplied by the transmission of the filter itself. So this is just the optical, and Neil talked about the, uh, the uh, uh, potentially red objects out, out here in the near infrared, which I'll come to. So what we do is we comp you can combine those, of course, and get a nice color image. So this is a nice image of a supernova through several, three of these filters combined to give a, uh, to give a col uh, color image. So PanSARS has a set of six filters, not exactly like these, but pretty similar. It's called the GRIZY, which is the Sloan type um, filters but they cover the same, uh, the same wavelength range. So in these different filters, so this is what we, we uh, this is the plot again with um, um, these kilonova models. So these are neutron star mergers with the, uh, driven by the, R, the radioactivity from the R process elements and the opacity from the R process elements, which gives us this. Um, so this is the, the luminosity and en en energy, and this is the absolute magnitude. <laughs> so these are the sorts of things um, that we will be looking for. Um, so let me, let me give you an idea. So you want to think of what is the likelihood and what sensitivity do we need to reach to actually measure these, potentially neutron star mergers uh, at these magnitudes. Uh, so the thing to keep in mind, here's uh, a couple of... Um, uh, sort of rules of thumb to try and keep in mind to give you an idea of what's what's possible. Um, so we're all familiar with distance modules, concept of distance modules. So this just comes from um, the definition of magnitude and the fact that absolute magnitude is the is the um, is the magnitude of, of an object when it's at ten parsecs. So if you rearrange that, you get the distance modulus uh, equation. So that's the magnitude that you see minus the absolute magnitude. And you'll see those plots of absolute magnitude in the previous one, um, uh, previous uh, figure. So if you're working in parsecs, this is the equation. Better to work in megaparsecs because we're not really dealing with parsecs for these things. So better to work to have this in mind. So this is the thing, and I'll, I'll show you the, um, the, the various distances, the sort of I, uh, I bought the uh, factors of 10 differences in the, in the values for distance modules you want to keep in mind. Um, also, you'll often see, you'll see plenty, when you're looking at papers and you're seeing um, theoretical models of things, you'll often see them in energy, um, urge per second, uh, luminosity, uh, you see them in power or luminosity, which is urge per second, the physical unit, and then you'll also often see things as in absolute magnitudes. A good rule of thumb, uh, you, can, you should work it out exactly when you, when you convert between the two, but if you put in Vega, which is uh, 
V0, and that's the, uh, that's the flux, the flux density for, for Vega. When you work this out, keep in mind, here's the way to remember it, minus 16 corresponds to about 10 to the 42 rems per second, roughly. So factor for the few in there, but just keep that in mind. The way to remember it is 4 plus 2 is 6. That's the way I remember it, just keep it in mind. So 10 to the minus 42 is roughly minus 16. Uh, so you'll see lots of things like this, and when theorists tell you what it's 10 to the 43 yards per second, and they'll ask you, or you who are observers, might you want to, uh, would you be able to detect that? Just try and keep that one in your mind. Minus 16 is 10 to the 42, roughly, not exactly, but it's good enough for now. So um, these are the things to keep in your in your head. So as, as Neil pointed out, he was um, the nearest. Short GRBs are typically a few hundred megaparsecs. They've been detected four or five hundred megaparsecs away. Distant modulus for one megaparsec. So this is the local group of galaxies, Andromeda, M33, uh, lots of the dwarf galaxies within uh, megaparsec. Um, unlikely we're going to get any, uh, anything within, within that because we've only got two large spiral, three large spiral galaxies, including our own, within a megaparsec or so. 10 megaparsecs is sort of what we define as the local universe. Most galaxies within 10 megaparsecs, nearly all, have been quite well studied. All with those with significant mass or significant star formation rates. There's several local volume surveys that go out to 10, 11 megaparsecs. So the local galaxy population is very well studied within 10 to 11 megaparsecs. Um, out to 100 megaparsecs, most ga galaxies have got redshifts of distances maybe 90% complete, roughly, unless there's a huge population of very low mass galaxies that we, uh, that we don't know of, but if they're low mass, they're probably not going to produce um, transient events, unless there's lots of them. But let's assume within 100 megaparsecs, we've got a reasonable um, um, catalog of known galaxies with redshifts and therefore with, uh, with distances. So then the thing to keep in mind here is 35 because 100 megaparsecs currently is roughly the uh, the LIGO horizon limit, right, for detection of binary black holes. Sorry, binary neutron stars. Obviously, the black holes go out further to get to a gigaparsec. They go out to about about a gigaparsec or so. This is module 40 and a redshift 0.21. So these this is the redshift here corresponding to these uh, these distances. But this is the figure here to keep in mind. Distance module is 35. 100 megaparsecs is roughly the LIGO limit for binary neutron star mergers. So what we're looking for here, 35 minus 15 is about 20th. So we need to reach 20th, these surveys, these wide field surveys, we need to reach about 20th magnitude um, or we are, we're not gonna really probe these, these models. In the optical, in the near infrared, you can maybe a bit, they are, they are uh, projected to be brighter, but certainly in the optical, around 20th magnitude is the figure we wanna get. We wanna get a, a, about a magnitude shallower than that because you wanna get, you just wanna detect uh, the, the object as it fades or as it rises as well. So we don't wanna just hit the peak magnitude, but get a, a, about a magnitude deeper or so. So this is the one to keep in mind here roughly. Uh, this is the one we have been working with, with uh, binary black holes that have gone out to this distance. Uh, of course, so this is our distance here. What would that redshift depend on if I work out that redshift? So I've, if, I, if I take my distances and then I work out what redshift that is, what of course does that depend upon? What have I assumed to get a redshift if I have a distance? Cosmology, cosmology. Yep, just a Hubble constant. So you can see that that drifts from 0.25 to 0.21, and that's the effect of uh, omega lambda coming in there. That's the reason that's not 0.25 when you multiply that by 10. So this, this just assumes the Hubble constant, and then once you get out to a megaparsec, you can see the cosmology effect coming in here. Uh, so these, radi these uh, radioactive transfer models, so these, these uh, the models that Neil talked about from neutron star merger, they're peaking around 10 to 41, 10 to 42. Look at the time scale here. Um, so if this was the gravitational wave event, within 10 days, these fade rapidly. So you've got to be pretty quick here to pick it up early and then try and find objects as they, as they fade. Um, the key thing, is, as, as Neil talked about, if you, um, the opacity in these um, is currently very uncertain, uh, but it's, it's, um, if these are calculations based on, so this is the opacity of material as a function of wavelength. Um, the gray and the purple lines are iron, 
which would dominate normal ejecta from, say, a supernova type uh, event. And the other lines are uh, including the R process elements, so the lanthanides and the actinides. So you can see the opacity goes up by several orders of magnitude. So it is uncertain, but it's, all, it, it's definitely going to have, a, 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 I think everyone agrees it's going to have a large effect. Exactly what the effect is is a little bit uncertain. Uh, these might be even fainter then than minus 14 or minus 15. The, 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 the uh, light may come out then in the mid infrared if, the, if this is very, if this opacity is very high, as, uh, as Neil mentioned. But uh, <clears throat> given this uncertainty, uh, we want to go a little bit deeper then than, the, uh, than even the um, um, it's sort of minus 14, minus uh, 15 region. There is some hope, though. Uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the R process uh, kilonova is the black line here. And as I mentioned before, if there's any nickel, nickel 56 produced, that can drive quite a, 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 br a significantly brighter outburst. Um, nickel 56 is important because this, of course, is what drives type 1A supernovae. So in a white dwarf, where you've got carbon and oxygen white dwarf, and you've got a thermonuclear explosion, that white dwarf, once it reaches the, the Chandrasekhar limit, standard picture of a type 1A supernova, you've got a white dwarf, a companion, which is either a normal star or perhaps a binary system, uh, produces a white dwarf, which is greater than Chandrasekhar limit, the temperature goes up, reaches temperature um, required to burn carbon and oxygen to the intermediate mass elements, um, and nickel 56 through thermal nuclear runaway. So the reason that doesn't that produces radioactive nickel 56 um, uh, because you've got to preserve the proton and neutron uh, number. That's why you don't produce iron and immediately you don't produce stable iron. Uh, you produce nickel 56, which decays the cobalt, cobalt decays the iron, and that's the stable iron, or most of the stable iron in the universe comes from the type 1A supernovae. But this is a very efficient process at extracting energy in a, in a, in a, or giving energy in a, a luminosity in an explosion. Uh, type 1A supernova rise, have a rise time of about 20 days, and that's a combination of the fact that the half-life of nickel 56 is six days, and the eject total ejecta mass determines how, how fast light comes out. Um, and a combination of those two means that about two weeks it takes to, uh, to rise to peak. So nickel 56 produces quite luminous explosions. If there's any nickel 56 produced in these, in these neutron star mergers, and it has been suggested these disk winds might be able to produce nickel 56, then it may be that uh, there's an early precursor peak here that we may get in the, in the optical. So the point of this is that it's still quite uncertain what we might uh, see. It might be the, the bright near infrared kilomanova type things. There may be brighter, bluer radiation that comes out early in the first few days. Uh, and so the lessons for, our, for the observational astronomers is to, is to go look and see what you find. There's enough uncertainty here um, that, it's, that it's worth probing um, in the optical at, at early stages. Uh, so of course this is the uh, Neil showed a version of this. This is the spectrum of a uh, of a of a kilonova in the in in the uh, cyan. It's just the R process uh, emission from the from driven by the R process elements. So that does peak in the near infrared beyond ten thousand angstroms, beyond a micron. Uh, but the nickel process may give us a blue peak. Uh, and when you put those through those filters, it gives us around minus 10, or minus potentially peaking at minus 15 in, the, in these optical filters. So minus 15 at the horizon limit of LIGO, 100 megaparsecs, 20th magnitude. So that's why it's worth looking down at the 20, 20th, 21st magnitude uh, regime to see if there's any possibility of finding. So what distance and volume might we be sensitive to? Um, so what do we need to consider? Obviously, we, wanted, we need to consider the distance to which LIGO and Virgo are sensitive to. So, of course, if we... Um, so let's say we do have a... Um, so this is our telescope here. Looking out. This is us. Okay, so uh, let's say this is our sky area. This is the LIGO error box, which is all a bit wavy. Uh, and we want to probe 
out to roughly 100 megaparsecs, we think, well, it's a neutron star system, LIGO's not going to detect it at a gigaparsec. We want to be, we want to be detecting things which are around minus 14 to minus 15 at 100 megaparsecs. So if we set our, we're looking for then for, to get to about 20, magnitude 20, 21 in our survey across those, let's say it's 500 square degrees. Bit of a challenge at the minute, but that's it. Right? So if we set up to try and do that, what are we, what, what are we more likely to find? So we're looking for things within this. We say, well, we know the, uh, we know LIGO's telling us that it's, that our source is probably in here. This disk might be 80 megaparsecs, might be 120 megaparsecs, but it's roughly in here. What do we, mo if we set up our server and we do it, we go and look at this sky area. What are we more likely to find? Uh, so let's, Correct. So let's say we get our let's say we get the, the um, get rid of all the junk in the images, and we and we we can reduce it to all of our astrophysically true false positives. Uh, what are we likely to find? Supernova. Supernova. Whereabouts? Yes, but whereabouts on this? So supernova are much brighter than kilonova, the potential kilonova. So where would you think you would find them? Okay. Exactly. So you going if we're surveying here, effectively what we're doing is we're not just we're not just surveying this little bit here. We're surveying all of this. If we to, if we if we set it to some magnitude limit, and this distance just depends on the intrinsic brightness of the, of, the super, of the source, of the supernova. So for things which are intrinsically brighter, if we go at 20, 21, we're just going to be finding things, lots of things out here. But because supernova are quite common by volume, and we're searching a large volume, we're just going to be, we're basically dominated by the background fog of supernova popping off here. So we're looking for things in here. Totally, uh, the, the astrophysical, we, we find loads of dozens hundreds of transients, but they're all nearly always here. Of course, we're also, we also get lots of variable stars in here too, in our own galaxy, which are reasonably easy to get rid of. You know, most of them are associated with, uh, with stellar sources. But you're, sort of dom you're dominated by a very nearby fog, and then the, the distant fog of these, of these objects. So the challenge then becomes, you go and do it, and you find loads of things that might be uh, on loads of transients, which we have experience of doing. So this is the challenge then. The next challenge, if you, even if you can do this, the 500 square degrees, and get the 20th and 21st magnitude, and find all the sources, you're totally dominated by things that have nothing to do. And you might, there, there's only, there's a maximum of one source that might be related to the, to the, to the gravitational wave. All right, so neutron star mergers typically will be 70 to 100 megaparsecs. Um, Neutron star black hole mergers, maybe a bit further. This distance does matter though, because the distance, the volume of which we search, of course, goes up by the cube of the, um, of the distance. So even if uh, the distance goes from, horizon distance of LIGO goes from 70 to 100 megaparsecs, then the volume increases by nearly a factor of four. So every time LIGO get one of, the, uh, one of their upgrades and they go a bit further in distance, really makes a big difference for, uh, for, the, for the rates. Uh, particularly for uh, for neutron star neutron star mergers where we haven't discovered one yet, and we're probably you know the, the numbers that are totally dominated by the by the volume covered. Okay, so 100 megaparsecs. We've seen the sort of um, the magnitudes we need to reach. We're down here at about uh, 20, 20 to 21, 20, 21st magnitude here um, for this. Okay. Uh, so we'll do this. Um, so we'll take three examples, and we'll do just to give you an idea of how, lo how long one of these, how, how long it might take us with one of our telescopes uh, to do a sky localization region. So I've got. Oh, oh, what time am I due to? What time are we due to finish? Three. Three. Yeah. Three. Um, 
This, but this will take longer than 10 minutes. Uh, OK, I'm going to leave you at this task. That, what's that? No, no, I want to, I want to, I'll finish it through. So I'm going to leave you with this to, uh, I'm going to leave you with this to do. Um, you can do it by yourself. Um, because uh, there are a couple of thing, other things I want to uh, cover. Uh, let me just see. All right, so, um, yeah, I'll leave you to do this by yourself and I'll give you, I'll give you an idea um, of what um, of what the numbers are. So if you, if we, let's say we do want to, to, to look at about a thousand square degrees, the distance to our source is 100 megaparsecs, you need to reach minus 15, uh, which means ideally uh, we want to reach uh, a magnitude of 20. Uh, if I give you an ex if I give you the answer for so at a thousand square degrees, you might think, well, what about a, a little telescope like a Sasson? Uh, it comfortably do uh, with an eighty square degree field of view, uh, ten exposures. I guess it's the eight hundred square degrees. We comfortably do that, um, but we obviously want to reach twentieth magnitude. And that night, remember I said ninety seconds can only get you to seventeen point five. Now because we're sky limited. Um, the, uh, the exposure time goes as the difference in flux squared, right? So if you want to go a factor of two deeper and you're sky limited, you've got to go, you've, your exposure time has got to go up by a factor of four um, because the noise in the sky, um, uh, the signal to noise is um, the square root of the total number of counts in the sky. Okay, so once, you're, once you become sky limited, then it becomes more difficult to go deeper. So let me just give you the answer for Assassin to show you that this is probably, this is not real, it's at 100 megaparsecs, the little very wide field telescopes uh, become um, probably not competitive if we're in this regime of, uh, of, of Kilanova. It might be really good for very bright, fast things where you can get on it and map out the whole thing quickly. But to find Kilanova at the 100 megaparsecs, this is, this is uh, difficult. So if you wanted to just sit with Assassin, do the hundreds, uh, thousand square degrees, and just increase the exposure time to get to a magnitude of 20. You can convince yourself that this will take about so the 0.4 uh, meter Sasson aperture with its roughly 80 square degrees will take about. I did the calculation of about. Uh, 30, about 30 hours to cover that. Um, and so that's three nights, so that's three nights of good weather. Yep. Well, I think so the biggest problem here is that it takes time to go from one location to another location with a telescope. And we didn't really do this time. Uh, <laughs> correct. So this is, um, so, if, so Assassin is doing um, uh, 90 second exposures. And it's got an overhead of maybe 15 seconds to, to move, right? Let's say it's, that's well. Let's say it's 30 seconds, so it's a, another factor of 30 uh, percent. So it's 30 hours exposure time, and probably, and then you've got to add on the overhead as well of moving the telescope and things. So you're probably up around 40 hours in total. Okay. Um, once so, um, once you get down below 30 seconds. Uh, so that's why, as I said, it doesn't really make much sense to go below 30 seconds for the exposure time. So assume that Assassin is doing um, 90 seconds and then stacking them. It could do longer, of course. It could, it could sit on the field longer. So it's a border 30 hours exposure time. That's three nights uh, already just to do that. Um, and then you want to repeat to do it again. And it requires three nights of good weather and stacking up all the data. So it this just becomes... In, in the small apertures, although they're very wide field, are not that competitive for... Uh, for the Kilanova type things. As I say, they might be for some weirdly bright uh, flash that's given out that, that uh, has got a shorter time scale, but not for these. Um, the, um, so I'll also leave you to do it. So with, with, um, if you do it with, uh, with, with pan stars and hyper supreme cam, uh, you'll see that those are um, of order, you get, uh, of order a night and you, and you can do it. Um, 
uh, with those. So when you do the calculations, you'll see that those are tractable within an eye to get of order a thousand square degrees. Uh, however, what other so, so um, as well as as the as the issue with the um, overheads, uh, there's something else that we need to consider. You wouldn't want to do it just once per night, every bit of the sky once per night. Why is that? That's one reason. Another, even more practical reason why you want to observe twice per night. Think of real things. Assume we've got rid of all of the, uh, the junk in the images. Think of real things that you want to get rid of. Satellites, satellites. satellites. natural satellites, but they're not the dominant factor. Stars, but they're also not the dominant factor, not the dominant contaminant. Clouds. Uh, let's assume it's clear. <laughs> so, what do you? So, there's something else which is the dominant source in these in these images. And I've been burned by this in the past. What else might be between us and the closer than stars, further than the clouds, further than satellites? Uh -huh. The sun, we're not, yeah, let's assume we, we know it's nighttime. <laughs> Moon or planets? Pla planets, okay, we, we know where all the planets, are. we know where all the major planets are. You're getting close. Asteroids. Asteroids, they're everywhere. <laughs> Every time you go and look, they're, they are the dominant source in all of these images. So they're really easy to get rid of. You just take two images separated by 30 minutes. If it moves, it's an asteroid. Right. <laughs> Uh, but you have to do it because they're told if you take one image you go on point or oh, you'll find loads of things uh, Which look really interesting and they're all asteroids <laughs> You'll find things on top of weird galaxies and you think oh, I'll find an interesting supernova in this guy It's an asteroid unless you take a second image. It's nearly always an asteroid. So you must take two uh, Images at least uh, to get to, to get rid of loads um, then uh, the key thing is um, You've got to be looking, we want to look for things which do have galaxies that look like they're at 100 megaparsecs. So here's an example here of a supernova and our difference image in, in pan stars, which is at 100 megaparsecs, 115 megaparsecs. Um, here are two examples. Um, so here's an example where there's no supernova and then there's a supernova that's after a day. So these are only separated by a day. So that's a young supernova here. Uh, which has been found. So you can see that's a nearby galaxy. Most galaxies at 100 megaparsecs are clearly resolved in these images. So uh, what we're looking for is something which is in a nearby galaxy, relatively faint because if it's really bright, it's probably a supernova. If it moves, it's probably an asteroid. So what we do is we we're, as we're searching, then we're linking all of this other information we have from other catalogs. Is it a galaxy? Do we have a, a distance estimate for the galaxy? If we've no distance at spectroscopic redshift, do we have a photometric redshift, which is an estimate? So trying to put all of these together to weed out the things which are, which are here, the really nearby things, and weed out the things which are here. So there are techniques to do that and try and find things in these regimes then to follow up. Because, of course, with things we think are 100 megaparsecs, then we'd like to go with a big telescope, VLT or Hubble, or near-infrared telescopes to see what it's like in the near-infrared. But we don't want to do that for every source because, you know, they're all, down, they're all out here and we may, we're just looking for one. So that's the practicalities. I'll leave you to do the, um, so this is what you typically find. You don't, as we go and we point our telescope, we don't usually have a big bright uh, source at 100 megaparsecs looking at us. We have all of these things and little galaxies, uh, some with no galaxies at all, some with no hosts at all. Um, and so those are, those are the difficult ones. Is it in a faint galaxy which might be at 100 megaparsecs or is it in a much more uh, distant galaxy? So all of, uh, lots of challenges there. The only thing, the, the major thing I think our, our strategy would be to combine things like uh, the near infrared with the optical, potentially with x-rays to see if we can find some, some transient that's giving us a signature that does not look like a normal supernova here or a normal variable star here. Um, okay, let me just give you then, so we have done this uh, three times um, for black hole mergers. We haven't found anything that is, um, uh, is likely to be uh, linked, but let me give you an example of, of what we did um, for the one in January in particular. So for these two, for the first one, the second one, the first one was a bit of a damp squib because they, um, 
we uh, we were just sort of understanding. I think all of us were just understanding the sky maps. The sky maps impro uh, improved quite quickly. We were just all getting to know what the sky maps were actually called and which ones to use. The first few days, we pointed at probably the wrong sky map at the, at the time, and then it improved significantly between the. Uh, uh, the first analysis and the, and the final analysis that LIGO did. Uh, so the first one we, we observed, uh, we did put quite a lot of effort into it, and quite a few groups did, but we were mostly looking in the wrong piece of sky. Uh, second, this is the second one. I'll show, if, you, if you see the tiled images here, uh, the green, so the, you can see the LIGO banana, and the green circles are our pan stars uh, footprints. So we did a reasonably good job in the northern hemisphere. Uh, the Palomar Transient Factory also did a, a, a very similar sky area. Um, uh, Neil showed you the uh, the Vista footprints from the uh, from the first one that they did. So in this one, we mapped out um, about a quarter of the probability of the of the of the sky map. Which again, if you combine, if we could combine that with other people in the world in the southern hemisphere, um, uh, then that's getting up to be a, a reasonably interesting uh, uh, piece of the of the of the probability banana. Um, and of course, we do have this the advantage we do have the um, this um, all sky image with uh, with pan stars that we can compare it to. Uh, so if I show you, let me just see. Uh, for this for the second one, so the Boxing Day burst. This is a zoom in of what we um, of what we did with pan stars, and there are all the transients we found. So find loads of things. Right? So lots of they're all supernovae. Uh, we did find one this uh, one object which was very blue and rising rapidly at. at as soon as the, uh, within a day of the gravitational wave discovery, we found one which was rising rapidly. Uh, looked quite unusual, looked very blue. Uh, so it's just to show you are capable of picking things out that are not the normal um, supernova-like things. Turned out it wasn't, it was a supernova uh, uh, at the end, but we, were, we, did, we did pick it out as something which looked unusual. So you tend to find lots, dozens of, um, up to 100 uh, uh, optical transients in these, in these sky regions. Uh, we found 50, and we spectroscopically classified 20, um, and that's probably going to be our strategy going forward. Maybe com combining with uh, the near infrared uh, uh, surveys that might pick out something with which, with unusual colours. Um, this shows you what we did. The the, uh, the 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 red dots are are sensitivity limits for across the whole focal plane of pan stars within. Uh, 12 days of the of the gravitational wave discovery, um, the lines show you what a kilonova would look like at 100 megaparsec. So, uh, in the I band, we, we we would have been we would have been able to detect that for these optimistic estimates of uh, of kilonova at 100 megaparsecs. Turns out this source was at 400 megaparsecs, and of course it was a black hole merger, so we didn't really have any chance of, of finding this type of uh, event. But at 100 megaparsecs, then this, this survey. Uh, similar to Neil's is quite uh, competitive. Uh, now, this, an advantage we do now have from LIGO is that they can give a rough distance estimate from the analysis if the signal to noise is high enough uh, from, the, um, from, from the waveforms. They can actually give a probability or a distance range to the source. So in, in the top figure there, you can see the three uh, that were uh, the, three, the first three um, discoveries. Uh, black hole mergers where they have distance estimates to the source itself. So LIGO now produce those in real time and give those to the electromagnetic uh, uh, partners. Uh, so that immediately gives us an idea of where we should be searching, whether it's you know 100 megaparsecs, 500 megaparsecs. If it is a binary black hole system, sorry, binary neutron star system, and more or less know it's going to be closer than about 100 megaparsecs because that's the sensitivity limit. But any information they can give us on distance, then that helps us reduce the background contamination and, and shows us shows us where to look. Okay, so uh, so I'll draw this to an end just with this, um, just to give you a, a, a quick overview of what we did for this one in in uh, January. So we we observed this one in, in January um, with Atlas and Pan Stars. Um, that was the if you look at this bit of the sky banana here. So this is the bit that we targeted, the highest probability region. It was nicely placed for Hawaiian observing. Um, and so we got on at the next uh, dark night with several very nice clear nights straight after this, uh, this detection. So we got on it very quickly. We mapped out that area. So that's the area of the sky banana here in, in red. The green circles are pan stars and the, and the gray 
uh, tiles are atlas footprints, the fields of view. So in the first three days, we mapped out all of this. Uh, and in the first night, um, uh, so Atlas is in, in, just to remind you, Atlas and Pan Stars are in Hawaii, on the, on the islands of Hawaii. They're both, uh, both on Haleakawa in, in Maui. Um, so in the, I'll, I'll just leave you with the specs of Atlas, but I'll just show you this. In, in the first night, so within, um, what was it, about eight hours of us starting to observe after, after this, we spotted this. Um, so this is unusual. Um, and immediately, of course, I got very excited because this is just go and point at the field. Immediately, something interesting pops up. Um, you very rarely see this. So this is a water. If you can look at that, that's a that's a water of about uh, one hour, and that decline is real. That's about a magnitude of one hour. Hardly, hardly ever. We, we do these surveys all the time. You hardly ever see that. You, so supernova decline periods of days to weeks. Um, cataclysmic variables decline of order of days. Uh, end dwarf flares are pretty fast decliners, but they're usually even much quicker. They're of, of order um, um, four or five magnitudes in 20 minutes. So this is something which was fast, but not as fast as end dwarf flares. It's right in the uh, highest probability region of the sky banana. I have looking at Atlas and Pan Stars images for years. I never see any of these. So of course I got very excited uh, about this. Uh, no host galaxy, obvious. We can just see it here. There's no host galaxy uh, exactly at that position. When you go and look at a deep image, interestingly, this host galaxy, this is the object here that we find, this host galaxy is at exactly the same redshift as what LIGO said the, uh, the gravitational sor wave source was at. So I thought, mm, we better follow this. Um, a day, uh, it turns out that there was a gamma ray burst uh, discovered um, by two satellites which have got really poor sky localization. So there was one discovered 24 hours after. So we discovered this. We saw this out about 22 hours after the trigger, the, the, uh, the LIGO trigger. Um, and, it just, and it happened that there was a, a GRB discovered by two satellites, Polar and Astrosat, both of which have got really poor sky localization. Uh, it was also then picked up by the Conus, by Conus Win and Integral. So a triangulation of all of these uh, uh, satellites then produced uh, this uh, annulus here. So the, they said the GR, there, is a, there is a GRB and it went off a bit before that we discovered this object. Um, and it's within this sky annulus here. Uh, so it turns out that the, uh, this object we find is almost certainly not related to the gravitational wave source, but it just happens to be a GRB in the field, exactly in the field of view, which was not discovered by Swift or Fermi and therefore had, had uh, good localization. Uh, but we discovered it before, uh, discovered the afterglow before the, the localization of the GRB was even known. Uh, so it turns out there's, um, uh, when you go and look at the, at, the, at the field and you look at, this is, the, this is the galaxy which has got the same redshift as, what we, as the gravitational wave source, when you go and take a deep image, there's actually a little galaxy at the position of our Atlas 17 AU object. There's a little galaxy here and a little galaxy here. We took a really deep spectrum of them both because if they turned out to be also at this distance, then it would be, become interesting. There's no, there's no plausible model really that has a GRB going off 24 hours after the gravitational wave source, but you know, you just gotta do the probability. You just gotta look and do the probability. So we did take a spectrum of this. We couldn't get a redshift for either of them. Very faint trace here. These are, uh, the, the two galaxies were are 23rd magnitude and 24th magnitude, 25th magnitude. We've got signal from both of the galaxies. Uh, no redshift though, unfortunately. So we would still like to get a redshift of this uh, because if it did turn out to be um, at the sim similar, within the, the, the redshift regime of the gravitational wave source, then um, of GW170104, then we would have to redo our probability calculations. But I'll sum up the probability calculations is that if you, if you look at the probability of, of um, our object and, this, and the GRB being a coincidence, um, it's really just a 1% chance of, this, of this, af this rapidly fading afterglow being at roughly the same position as the triangulation of the GRB, but totally unassociated. Uh, so it's likely that they are the GRB is associated with this optical afterglow that we found. 
Um, so we reject the hypothesis that they're a coincident, just a random coincidence, 2.6 sigma, probable. Um, and if we had a redshift, uh, oops, sorry. If we then think of, well, what's the probability of the G Atlas 17 AU and our GRB and the gravitational wave source being coincident? And you can go through the numbers there. It's really just the rate of GRBs per day times the LIGO map. It's about 4% chance of uh, having a coincidence. So it's probably a coincidence. That's not that it's significant, but not that significant. So unless we could constrain this further and have and constrain the these two galaxies to be within the uh, distance of LIGO, uh, the LIGO estimates for the gravitational wave source, uh, we think this is just a chance coincidence. So even you know you get rid of the asteroids first of all, and then you get rid of the supernova, and you're still left with things that are uh, contamin unusual things that contaminate the source, the uh, the, the error box. So that's the problem with these large error boxes with things which are 100 to 1,000 square degrees. There's lots of interesting things in there that you have to weed out. Uh, so this is really just a, a lesson learned. Um, we did propose that, you know, there, there, as I say, there have been these proposals for EM signatures from stellar mass black holes, if you've got any mass around them. Um, but uh, we, will, uh, we assume that it's not. So Neil talked about the Fermi detection, uh, which I won't go... Um, which I won't go on about. This is um, the Fermi detection. Well, for the first gravitational wave source, conclusion probably is it's astrophysical, but probably not related, and it's a coincidence. Uh, but we are still looking. So the outlook now for beyond, I think we'll come back to this in the, well, I think what we'll do is just come back to this in the, in the panel uh, session. Um, uh, I can show this about what we might expect for 03 and then beyond in the, in the 2020s. Uh, so I think I'll finish up here. Um, we'll come back to this, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope in the, in the panel session. This really, if we don't find anything, so I, I think if we, if, I, if we just conclude, go to our uh, conclusion here, um, is, so currently we're working with sky boxes of, of order, a few hundred square degrees, a thousand square degrees. Um, we've got telescopes from 20 centimeters, 10, 20 centimeters, up to four meters that can realistically do significant fractions of the uh, of that error box. Not all of it, but significant fractions. If we don't find anything, either in the optical or the near infrared, as Neil showed, or in the high energy uh, regimes within the next, from uh, so 03 is going to start in 2018. We don't find them in the next four years, 2018 to 2022. We don't find anything there. I think the conclusion would be if there are counterparts, they're just too faint for, for these facilities that we have in the next few years. But in the 2020s, when LIGO India comes online, the error boxes will definitely shrink to have order a few tens of square degrees. And in the panel session, I'll show the capabilities of LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is really well matched to a few tens of square degrees. And you can really probe much deeper and fainter magnitudes. Then there's potential there, and that's well, many of you will make your careers in the in the 2020s. This is the uh, so if we if Neil and I don't get there first, <laughs> then it's, uh, I think there's a big opportunity there in the in the 2020s to to do this both with Lago India and uh, and LSST. So I'll stop there and then we'll we'll take the future in the in the panel session a bit. Thank you.